Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Withrow, and I'm the head of exhibitions and publications at the McMichael. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for a virtual curatorial talk from water to water away through the trees. I'll begin with a land acknowledgement. The McMichael Canadian Art Collection is located on the original lands of the Ojibwe Anishinaabe people. It is uniquely situated along the Carrying Place Trail, which historically provided an integral connection for Indigenous people between Ontario's Lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay region. As an institution, McMichael recognizes the importance of acknowledging the original territories of the Ojibwe Anishinaabe First Nations people and other Indigenous nations. I'll begin by turning it over directly to uh, our elder Shelley Charles to give a formal Anishinaabe opening of the circle. Shelley. so with those uh, first words, uh, hello everybody, welcome. Ani bojo sego. With those first words uh, that that I uh, shared, they were in Ojibwe uh, to welcome us um, to welcome us all in the circle, but also um, to acknowledge creation, to acknowledge creation, uh, and in, and specifically the four directions and that movement, all of that movement of creation that has brought us here, um, where we are uh, today sharing with each other, learning with each other. And in the sending up of those words as well, I had lit the fire, a smudge here. Tonight I'm also uh, some bare root uh, as well, locally, locally picked bare root. So it's in this way uh, that we have established at the McMichael to uh, ensure that we open with the fire, the medicine, in the language, in a good way, and we also ask that um, that our grandmothers and grandfathers look this way, look this way at this very, very exciting and important work uh, that we are um, embarking on and that we're going to share with you today. So I am going to just say, Apchiko <laughs> Gichimigwech. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Shelley. Um, before we begin, and I hand it over to our panelists in earnest, I just want to say three short things. Um, firstly, this talk is being recorded. Um, if right now you're thinking of someone who would love to be with us, please send them the link and have them come and join us. But uh, if not, you can find a link to the recording uh, of this conversation on the McMichael's YouTube channel in the coming days. Uh, secondly, we've reserved some time at the end for questions and uh, we encourage you to, as you're watching, if you have questions, please type them in um, to the Q&A or the chat uh, button. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on them and I, I hope we can get to as many as possible um, after we get, through, get uh, to the end of our uh, sort of planned points. Um, and finally, I'll introduce Sarah Milroy, our chief curator and one of our country's most respected public voices and champions of Canadian art. Uh, she's going to be doing kind of air traffic control among our panelists tonight. Sarah, uh, I pass the baton to you. Great. Thank you so much, Jen. And thank you, Shelley, for that beautiful opening gesture of yours. And um, we feel so privileged at McMichael to be working with such a wonderful circle of people uh, here tonight, but also, you know, so gratitude for being willing to come together. I know how busy everyone is. And gratitude to Bonnie and Mariah for basically moving in to the McMichael and changing everything around you, like this beautiful catalytic agent in our midst, uh, making your beautiful work, but also having amazing conversations um, with people who want to know 
<laughs> we could talk about that later, Bonnie. You want definite answers. And, and Bonnie is doing a lot of education at the same time that she's uh, you know, making this beautiful artwork with Mariah. So gratitude for that too, Bonnie, and for your patience at times. Um, the project is particularly wonderful for me to see because one of the first things I thought about when I came to the McMichael three years ago was the land, you know, this land that we are standing on at the McMichael. And it's such a feature of really what the McMichael is, which is a museum in nature. Um, but one of the things that people, you know, often don't know about the McMichael is that the, a third uh, of our collection is Indigenous art. Going, including Northwest Coast historic materials, a large collection of Norval Moriso, right up to the present day, um, and including Bonnie's mural now on the wall. So, you know, it's a large part of, of who we are, but it occurred to me that people coming to the McMichael might not be thinking about the land that we're on. So I thought, you know, maybe what we should do is find some sort of archeological, you know, objects that would show the many students that come to the McMichael, you know, what was here long before settlers came into this area and certainly before Robert and Sidney McMichael built house on the hill. Um, but then at around the same time as I was kind of puzzling over this and talking with TRSA about what they held and it was over a million objects, um, I got to know Bonnie Devine better and suddenly those two line trajectories crossed in my brain and the light bulb went off and it was like, Bonnie, can, can, would you be willing to talk about this place we're on, about the Carrying Place Trail, which runs just below us along the Humber River, really close by to the museum and all the way down, of course, to the lake shore and up to the um, Lake Simcoe and Georgian Bay region. And she agreed to, to dive into the research and the work of that. So, um, uh, so we, we got going and, you know, the project is not completed. I on purpose chose a, a picture that shows you Bonnie's working materials here for the landing page here, um, to show you that this is still a work in, in progress. And this conversation I'm sure will be a part of Bonnie's thinking as she moves forward, um, you know, with this project. So, um, the first person here, here is the, the, I don't know, I mean, we're gonna get this slightly out of order here. It's a beautiful picture of the what is known now as the Seed Barker site, which is um, downstream, down the Humber from the McMichael, but a, a place where Bonnie and I had a very wonderful afternoon um, experiencing this very, very sweet land that is very close to the McMichael. Um, I want to um, start by introducing Catherine. Catherine, who's here, at least right beside me on my screen. Uh, Temeshro, people of the Little Turtle, Wyandot of Anderdon Nation, Wendat Confederacy. Catherine Tomorrow is a multidisciplinary artist whose practice spans decades, although she doesn't look it. Catherine is a seated spotted turtle clan faith keeper and is active throughout the city of Toronto and beyond in many organizations as elder in residence, mentor, teacher, and cultural advisor. She's an alumna of the Ontario College of Art and has had a diverse career, multiple exhibitions and installations, has published written works and presentations and continues her own creative practice. Catherine actively supports the work and development of other artists on an ongoing basis. She served on the board of the uh, Toronto Art Council's Income Precarity Working Group and was the chair of the Toronto Art Council's Indigenous Advisory Committee in 2021, and is the new Indigenous Arts Program Manager at the Toronto Arts Council and continues teaching, learning, and exploring her creativity and the creativity of others. Catherine, would love to hear what you are thinking about tonight. Kwe, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, kwe, everybody, Kwe Aweti, Kwe Dominic, my brother from Wendaki, Kwe Elder Shelley, thank you for that beautiful opening. Uh, Kwe Bonnie, uh, so wonderful to be in your presence again, and Mariah and everyone. Um, it's lovely to be here this evening and I'm very thankful to be asked. I'm gonna just quickly introduce myself in Wyandotte so that people get a chance to hear what that sounds like. Mm. So we say, Tomeshra Ijatsi, Ndat Jato, Ngya Awish, Hati Yurong, uh, Wandat Ndi, so that basically means that I'm, uh, uh, I sit with a small turtle clan uh, and uh, I am 
won that. Uh, and the people of the little turtle, or as the linguist I work with says, a turtleite. That's kind of how it translates directly. I'm a, a little turtleite. Um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I've come to know Bonnie in the last couple of years, and certainly I knew of her through her um, incredible reputation in the community, but I've, I've gotten to know her as a person through the various um, places we've been together and the situations we've encountered together. And I must say that I am um, deeply moved by this work uh, for so many reasons. Um, uh, knowing Bonnie has been quite incredible in terms of um, being aware of the depth of the person that she is, um, the artist that she is, uh, the respect that she commands, the skill that she possesses, and the, the, the immense heart that she works with. Um, it's, it's been extraordinary to see these um, aspects of her character as they work their way into this beautiful mural that she's been um, collaborating with Mariah on. Um, it honors things that are so essential to all of us. Um, when we say in Wyandotte, what chimney are you from? Essentially, we're asking what fire are you from or what clay are you from? What earth are you from? And I think of these effigy pipes in terms of their connection to the earth and therefore the, the connection to the people who made them. And uh, to, to be in their presence and to touch them and to be with them is uh, kind of uh, knowledge transference and energetic exchange that is uh, almost impossible to describe, but incredibly powerful. And I think Bonnie has um, transposed that energy into this mural in, in the most beautiful way. Uh, it's a very powerful work. I can't wait to see the detailed slides, um, but, but mostly I think I, I want to just say uh, what an impressive human Bonnie is and what an incredible artist she is and yes and what a pleasure it is to see her uh, working through this process in this beautifully resonant energetic spiritual way thank you thank you Catherine and and uh I couldn't agree with you more um it's just it just goes deeper and deeper with Bonnie and uh, I should mention for people just so they know the kind of architecture of the evening we're going to have opening remarks from everyone now and then Bonnie's going to be taking us through this project but the pipes that Catherine is referring to is a suite of, of effigy pipes that were um, excavated from the Seed Barker site. And they were held by the Toronto Regional and Conservation Authority and by the ROM, who have very um, you know, graciously and openly shared them back with us. They're now on site at the McMichael and they are awaiting. We had a, a, a wonderful ceremony, the participants that are here, um, bringing them onto the site of the McMichael where they're now safely stored. And they will be in fact incorporated into Bonnie's work. So when, when Catherine's referring to the pipes, that's what she's referring to. But these, these wonderful faces that we see have, um, have their roots in objects that are not yet uh, out on the wall, but will be soon. And that will be, a, that will be an incredible moment. So we're next going to hear from, I might as well leave the slide up so people can look at this while while we're talking, don't you think, Bonnie? Okay. So Dominic St. Marie is a Wendat storyteller from the Wolf Clan. He has a degree in economics and is the land management advisor for the Wendaki Kahan, which includes parts of Southern Ontario. Dominic, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me here. It's and also pinch hitting as a tech IT guy a few minutes before we... <laughs> Live. I have my moments. Very grateful. <laughs> he has many powers. Yeah. Well, as it should always be, we all work to, uh, we all strive to become better people. Exactly. Uh, begins through learning everything we can when we can. Yep. Kwea witi to everyone who's watching. Hanaris kwa yatsi, wanda tindi, wanda kendare, yanaris kwa wa yokuta. Now, you may think that I speak weirdly compared to Catherine and you'd be right, as I'm speaking the Wendat language, which we've spoken differently for almost 300 years now. Mm. So it led to us speaking a different way and our language evolved in parallel. Now, it is a pleasure for me to be here, a pleasure for me to have been invited to try to work towards this beautiful piece. You know, rivers are crossroads. They are areas where people meet where people interact as they were the highways of yesteryears and they still are to, the, to some extent now. 
And as I was invited here, I came to meet elders, knowledge keepers, but I ended up meeting, as we say in one, that Aye Yen Ha, sisters. And it was a great humbling moment for me to meeting those people, to enjoying this contact, to coming back to this old homeland of the Wendat and to see that the people of this land still live by the values that the land taught us as it taught them as well. Now, what Bonnie has created is basically a representation of all those relationships that we need to build of all those contacts and those interactions with the land that we all are able to do at every single moment of our life. We may just take a moment and feel the power of the land. Mm. And it is to me the greatest honor of them all to be able to, to say that I know, that I consider the artist that creates, a, that creates such a beautiful thing and that I may call him my own sister. Dominic, thank you. What a beautiful, beautiful statement. Um, I'm just a little taken aback. Shelly, um, Shelly Charles, who, who opened our circle today is an elder and cultural advisor at the Michael, and she's worked in the GTA since 1983 in various capacities, including Executive Director and Dean, Indigenous Education and Engagement. She's worked throughout First Nations communities in the Great Lakes with artists and youth in a, with a focus on culture, land-based learning, and creative expression. And Shelley, I've been able to see a number of your um, interventions at McMichael with school children and adults, and you bring a magical quality to everything you do at the McMichael. Thank you for that. And please share your thoughts with what you're seeing here unfolding. Thank you, thank you so much for that um, that introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure for me uh, to be here today and witnessing this uh, creation, this artistic creation. For me, um, I've been um, in the opening. I said I was from Jonyong and Sing, and that's um, the Chippewas of Lake Simcoe in that region, which is just like sort of a, a stone's throw. Uh, from Toronto. But for me, I felt like this piece here reminds me of, um, um, it's connected to, as Dominic said, the meeting of each other, uh, the re-meeting of each other, um, and coming together in circle when we welcomed um, the pipes uh, to the McMichael. For me, it was very, um, very organic in, um, in this way. Over the years, um, I've worked with a number of elders um, in the community, and we have developed a narrative uh, and story and worked with research uh, on um, the connection of these um, waterways. So it felt like um, it felt like full circle as well. Mm -hmm. I, um, uh, as you said in the in the introduction, Sarah. I was executive director at the Association for Native Development in the Performing and Visual Arts for a number of years, um, a long time ago. <laughs> and it was there that I met Bonnie. And Bonnie was um, had uh, um, submitted some work for one of the first art shows uh, that I curated and co-curated as a team. So it was really significant for me uh, back then, because mm -hmm. at that time in Toronto, there was this real, um, this amazing change happening in our community, where the artists were developing not um, exclusively visual art anymore. There were musicians and storytellers and, and writers and performers, and everyone was involved in this um, the creation of uh, these um, just innovative works of art, works of art that told the story of our history and was really interesting for me because um, I am from this region, so born and raised in this region, and I'm related to, um, to many people here that, that 
this artwork here today is also that extended connection of the relationship to the land. So mm. for me, it's like coming full circle and, and, and coming home. And it's always exciting when people are from other places and other regions, when they can come here and um, help um, lift up our stories, lift up our local stories and contribute their translation uh, of that in a creative way. So I feel really, um, actually feel really blessed. So in the opening I had said, um, is that we're asking uh, for, for kindness and, and good thoughts as we're doing this work. And from the very beginning, uh, that's how we worked in this circle. When we did that ceremony with mm -hmm. the welcoming back of those uh, precious um, relatives at the McMichael. So it's a joy for me. And uh, it is also a joy to be able to be um, there at the McMichael um, in this capacity um, as an advisor, as a cultural advisor, an elder who's from the community. So thank you so much to everybody. And I'm so happy to have met Catherine and Dominic and the, the entire team um, as well. That's great. Thank you so much, Shelley. Uh, so um, Bonnie Devine, this would be an embarrassing night for you, Bonnie, because it was just a big love in. <laughs> but Bonnie is an installation artist, video maker, curator, writer, and educator. She's a member of the Anishinaabek of Gnadjing Serpent River First Nation on the North Shore of Lake Huron. And her work emerges from the storytelling and image making traditions that are central to Anishinaabe culture. Recent acknowledgements of Divine's practice include a Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts in 2021, a 2019 Ontario Lieutenant Governor's Heritage Award, and OCAD University's 2019 Distinguished Research and Creative Practice Award. Her installation, video, and curatorial projects have been shown in solo and group exhibitions and film festivals across Canada and internationally, including the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Berlin Film Festival, the National Museum of the American Indian, and Today Art Museum in Beijing. Divine is an Associate Professor Emerita and the Founding Chair of the Indigenous Visual Culture Program at OCAD University. She lives and works in Toronto. And I must say, Bonnie, you're also incredibly gifted in conversation. You, you are one of the great diplomats. <laughs> and I think that that aspect of your accomplishments are not, not acknowledged enough. You, you are an incredible teacher every time you open your mouth. So, um, Bonnie, um, I have a number of slides here that tell us allow you to tell us a little bit more about you before you came to From Water to Water. And so you tell me, you know, if you would like me to advance uh, into that, into these earlier images of your work and just tell me, Bonnie, when you want next slide. Okay. Do you want me to talk about this work? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> um, this, this is where I first, actually, I'm gonna talk for one sec, just to say that this is where I first uh, encountered Bonnie Devine. She was making this work on the wall and much at the Archive of Ontario and, and much like her process at the Big Michael, she was being interrupted all the time by people like me that wanted to understand what she was doing. It was a really, really striking, striking piece. And, uh, and I thought, you know, Bonnie, it would be good for you to, to show this work before we go into the current work because it's a kind of an obvious precursor in a way to what you're doing with us. Thank you. Yes, um, it is connected. I, sometimes you don't really know how artwork is connected until you're in the middle of it and you realize that you're actually um, extending your interest or, or your engagement with a certain subject. I've been interested in maps for a long, long time. And um, this was a, a mural project, really. It started out as a, as a mural project. You can see that I ended up taking up <laughs> way more space than was originally allocated to me. And this is kind of typical um, of me, unfortunately. It's great. Uh, but, you know, it was Andrew Hunter at the AGO who asked me to do this. And when I said, look, I, I kind of need the, the wall to the, to the left of the map, he said, sure. And then I said, well, I, after a, a month or so, I said, you know, I kind of need the rest of that wall. Yeah. 
and Andrew said, sure. And this is the kind of um, collaboration that I'm also finding at, at the McMichael. It's not that I've asked for more space, although I am <laughs> taking up a lot All of good, space. Buddy. And I know. And um, so this piece is called Battle for the Woodlands. I was very interested in the fact that the um, Great Lakes have been the site of conflict mm -hmm. for hundreds of years. And I was very interested in the fact that the Great Lakes um, are, are a site of conflict for different reasons. Um, for, for European settlers, of course, it, it's, um, um, they are strategic for uh, commercial purposes, for military purposes, uh, for travel. Uh, the Great Lakes open up the continent to exploration and settlement. Uh, for Anishinaabe people, for I think all indigenous people, the Great Lakes are much more than that. And that's why I painted them. You can see them in red there. Mm -hmm. um, those are not lobsters. <laughs> <laughs> Those are spirit animals. And I painted the Great Lakes as animals, as beings, as living sentient awarenesses uh -huh. uh, who are with us every day and uh, who we don't acknowledge enough. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, maybe next slide. Okay. Uh, I'll talk a little bit. That, that, oh, oh, no, sorry, that, that one. Hard. Oh, yes, okay. All right. So I made these three uh, figures. I made them on the site. And um, as, as we did with the McMichael, um, the AGO made it possible for me to have an assistant, a, um, a protege, a young apprentice who could come and work with me. And uh, uh, this is uh, Samantha. Oh, she was, I didn't write her name down. I'm going to forget. And that's terrible. I'll remember later. Um, but Samantha uh, came uh, from um, Wikwemakon, but she was studying at high school in Toronto, a young 18-year-old woman, and she came and I taught her how to weave uh, these figures. We made three of them. They're called the Anishinaabitude, and uh, this is uh, riffing on, um, on old um, uh, post-colonial discourse out of Algeria and Northern Africa, uh, something called negritude, mm -hmm. when uh, the idea of blackness was becoming a, um, a cultural conception that had political force. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in exactly the same thing for, uh, for the Anishinaabe, in fact, for all indigenous people in North America, um, a, a signifier. of our intellectual and the physical strength, and we are still here. Next slide, please. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the project that we're working on right now. Uh, it's called From Water to Water Through the Trees. Uh, the brainchild of Sarah Milroy, who of course you know is the chief curator at the McMichael Canadian Collection. Sarah wanted to commission an installation or a mural about the Carrying Place Trail and the Humber River for the gallery. And as I've been interested in maps and the story of Southern Ontario for a long, long time, I was glad to take on the assignment. I started with this map. Uh, it's the Toronto Carrying Place. Um, it shows the old indigenous portage route along the Humber River from Lake Ontario to the Holland Marsh and from there up to uh, Lake Simcoe. The map is the work of C.W. Jeffries. It was first published in 1933 in a book called Toronto During the French Regime by Percy J. Robinson. The dates on this map, and I think you can see it in this, um, mm -hmm. in this image, um, it's um, 1619 to 1793, um, were immediately interesting to me. 1619 would indicate Huron Wendat origins. Um, 1793, just six years after the first Toronto Purchase Agreement between the Mississaugas and John Graves Simcoe. If Jeffrey's dates on this map are correct, the trail was in active use by Indigenous people during one of the most turbulent and bloody eras in Ontario history. Our project was Sorry. scheduled to start, mm -hmm. I think we can mm -hmm. go to the next one. You wanna go to the next one? Okay. Yeah, we may as well. Yes, our project was scheduled to start in spring 2020, but was interrupted by COVID-19. Even so, 
in August of 2020, during a brief lull in the pandemic, which I'm sure you all remember, <laughs> several McMichael staff, my assistant Mariah, and myself met archaeologists and researchers from the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority at Seed Barker, which is a long abandoned site of a sizable Huron Wendat town a couple of kilometers south of the McMichael, just off Rutherford Road in the township of Vaughan. The Seat Barker was first excavated by Dr. Ronald B. Orr in 1895. He called it the Little Humber site, but the name was later changed to Seed Barker after the two owners of the land where the site was first uncovered. The University of Toronto excavated Seed Barker again in 1925 and 1951, but tragically in the 1960s, over three and a half acres of unexcavated land was destroyed to extract a large deposit of gravel that was discovered to lie beneath it, beneath the site of the village. Because there was no heritage legislation to protect the site at that time, no salvage was conducted and unknown quantities of precious cultural and archeological information was irretrievably lost. Today, less than two acres of the original site remain. Archaeologists from the ROM, in conjunction with the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority, who now own the land and protect it, excavated again in 1975 and founded an archaeological field school that has run almost every year since then. In 1997, excavations at Seed Barker uncovered several additional longhouses identify the internal details of those houses and define their boundaries. But on the day of our visit in August, 2020, Seed Barker was a wildflower filled meadow on a high plateau overlooking the Humber. There was no sign of the bustling Wendat town that had once stood there or the archeological activity I had expected to see. What we were shown was a number of fascinating and in fact, exquisite artifacts that had been excavated from the site during the 1990s. Unfortunately, I can't show you the most interesting of those, a group of eight human effigy pipes, because we do not have the permission of the Wendat Nation to photograph them. And I'm sure we'll talk about that um, in the discussion that will follow this uh, brief presentation. But I can tell you this, as soon as I saw those pipes, they became the subject and the center of the Carrying Place mural for me. Very shortly after that encounter, the McMichael and I began negotiations to borrow the pipes from the ROM and from the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority. Um, what slide are we on? Let's see. Oh, okay, yeah, this is a good slide. Um, more than a year passed as COVID raged on mm -hmm. until October 21, one month ago, when it was at last deemed safe to begin the mural project. Um, there's a image of the foot of the ramp that maybe we could show. I'm sorry, these, these slides might be a little okay. bit out of order. This one? <laughs> No, uh, never mind. Go back to the map one. It's okay. okay. Um, uh, we started at the foot of the ramp oh, that oh, leads oh. from the grand hall to the second floor galleries. I don't know it what's overlooks... going on here. Sorry. I, I just need to find out where you want me to be here. Uh, yeah, that's great. okay. Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry, buddy. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, the, the grand hall and the atrium beside it um, is where we started to work on the um, on the project. It leads to the second floor galleries via a, a ramp and overlooks the spectacular landscape that surrounds the McMichael. This is where uh, Mariah and I began to paint the trail. We started with maps and you can see the map here. Um, some we downloaded from the internet, some I hand drew all have been or will be transferred onto the walls of the atrium or onto the walls of the ramp. Uh, this is a map of the Humber River 
Um, and if you go to the next slide, yeah, this is a map of um, the trail from the Humber Bay on Lake Ontario. So that's down at the bottom uh, right of the, of the map um, through Lake Simcoe to the shores of Lake Huron at Georgian Bay, Huronia, Old Wendagi, the homeland of the Wendat, Wendat people. In the background on the table lies a TRCA uh, diagram of the seed barker site. You can just barely see it. Um, see all of these, I, yeah. I think all of these papers will go into the archive uh, for the McMichael so that they, they can be um, examined by researchers who are interested in, um, in this stuff. So this is where we walked that day, Bonnie, the picture I showed at the beginning of the landscape that has the terrace. Yes, you can you show that? Oh, yeah. This, yeah, we can zoom up there, what the hell? We can do whatever we want. There it is. There it is. So this area here is where we sat that day. Yes. And this is the platform that when we go back down, um, that we see here, here. I believe. That's right? correct. But all of this was torn up for gravel. It's it's um it's shocking and it's um it's it causes grief. All all I can say is that. Mm -hmm. Um Using a grid system, and you see it here on, uh, on this map. The next slide, please, Sarah. Yeah, using a grid system, uh, we scaled up the maps and transferred them to the walls. Um, and we began to imagine how we were gonna depict the effigy pipes. It was a very challenging task um, that we undertook with the advice and direction from our Wendat advisor, Dominic St. Marie, who's with us and our Wyandotte elder and faith keeper, Catherine Tamaro, who's also with us. Um, they, they told us that we were not to realistically represent the pipes, although we could draw them uh, from imagination. And we were asked to put them in a stone canoe. Here's my idea of the final rendering. And if you can go to the next slide there. Uh, this is a very rough drawing, but this was the very first time uh, that we began to think about how we could show the importance and the beauty of these pipes without actually depicting them. Um, Next slide. Uh -huh. Yes, please. Um, here's, here's how Mariah helped so much. This is a, um, an image of that atrium off the Grand Hall. And uh, you can see the gridded map behind. And then Mariah, through the mir miracles of Photoshop, um, transferred my drawing onto the wall. And we were able to sort of maneuver it around and find out where it would sit, where it would best fit. We could also scale it up and down, making it smaller and larger. This was incredibly important. Um, and then, of course, we had the grid there. So we were able to uh, draw. Uh, those figures onto the wall um, with the um, with the canoe and its passengers firmly placed. We began to paint. Um, maybe you can switch to the next slide, please. Yeah. So here's us. They gave us a sky jack. I had to get a license to operate it, and uh, we began uh, to paint. And you can see that this they the figures were the first things that were painted on the wall. We had the outline of the map, but this was not important. The very most important thing was to see those grandfathers, and I'm gonna call them grandfathers, but I know that I believe that there are at least two of these figures that are female, and I, I don't know why I think that, but I think that. Anyway, was to get them safely on the wall. Um, now, if you go to the next slide, this, um, this slide was, um, was taken by one of the visitors to the gallery. And one of the beautiful things about this project is being the interaction with visitors to the gallery. They uh, have been taking pictures and sending them to me via Instagram. And then when I ask them to you know, send me a, a shareable file, they've been doing that. So this picture was taken by Samantha Lee back in the early days, we, we've just, uh, you can see Mariah painting the canoe 
And you can see that all of the um, pipes are completely realized. And I'm down there mixing paint because I'm putting in the background, the land. Mm. And this is something important to talk about because it ended up that the land is almost as important as the pipes. They are, they are very, very tied together. And if you go to the next slide. Oh, not that one. That one. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can see um, this photo was taken by another visitor to the gallery, Helena Moncrief, um, who has a um, website called Fruitful City. Just a wonderful photographer. She did use a, a bit of a filter on this, so I can't claim that it looks exactly like this, but it's quite close. Um, and we ended up painting um, the green belt um, uh, around the Humber. And, and as I was painting that, I realized that uh, this is my land acknowledgement. This is what I mean when I hear that land acknowledgement in words. This is for me what a land acknowledgement looks like in paint. Um, so thank you, Helena, and thank you, Samantha, so much for sending me those beautiful pictures. Um, if, if you could um, change to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. uh, not that one, mm -hmm. the next, that one. I Thank don't know you. why it's jumping forward to my apologies, it's, Bonnie. It's okay, no problem. Um, once the main space was painted, we began to move up the ramp in homage to Shelley, Charles, Mariah, and my Anishinaabe ancestors. I painted a version of the canoe as the ancient ones might perhaps have drawn it as a pictograph on, on a, a cliff face. Mm -hmm. And the next slide, please. Most recently, I made this picture of a wolf. Oh. It's one of Mary Ann Barkhouse and Michael Belmore's sculptures of wolves on the McMichael grounds. I'm Are you sorry. finding I'm it? trying to find no. it for some reason. There, there. So that's sorry. it. Yeah. That's it. Um, the wolf is pointing the way up the trail. Mm -hmm. He is the first of three homages we will make to our wonderful, dear, lovely advisors before we finish this project. This one is for our one data advisor, Dominic St. Marie, who is a member of the Wolf Clan and whose guidance and support has been so important to us. We have plans for, for additional components, of course, most of which though, we're not quite ready to share yet. But Mariah can tell you about a personal aspect of the project that she's been working on. That's my presentation. Bonnie, thank you so much. And this wolf, can you can you tell us, Bonnie, about the the where this wolf is located at the McMichael because it also is part of our our history of our collection as well. Yes, well, Michael Belmore and um, Marianne Barkhouse made a series of bronze cast wolves. They're life size, and they're just as you approach uh, the front doors of the McMichael. They're they're situated in a beautiful grove of trees. And um, I just knew I had, I, I know both Michael and Marianne. And uh, I knew that I had to include um, one of their sculptures in this project. But I also knew um, that um, Dominic uh, needed to be placed here. He's at the, the wolf is at the beginning of the ramp and he is pointing the way mm. up to Old Wendagi. Uh, which is on Georgian Bay, and it just felt like um, mm -hmm. that needed that needed to be there. It's interesting. It seems to be a, a wolf thing happening at McMichael because there's also uh, the John McEwen wolf flame cut steel near the entrance to the institution. Uh, yes. And then, in about a year and a half from now, we're having a show of the artist Dempsey Bob, who's tall tan slinket from the North Coast of British Columbia. And he too is Wolf Clan. And I think right. his exhibition is going to be titled Dempsey Bob, Dempsey Bob Wolves. So the beat goes on. So <laughs> thanks, Bonnie, for that. Um, Mariah, okay, so we haven't heard from Mariah yet. 
but uh, Mariah Maywaski is an Anishinaabe settler and a creative person from the northern shores of Lake Huron. Her practice specializes in graphic design and illustration, but she will follow a story into whichever media fits best. Mariah has been freelancing since 2017 and creating work alongside individuals and teams at various companies and institutions across Canada and the US. And her love of storytelling and guides her exploration through temporalities and place, mapping memories and building relationships through visual, visual communication and also sometimes using her bicycle as an instrument of knowing, as we will now discover. <laughs> Mariah, please tell us what you've been up to on your bicycle. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Bonnie and Dominic and Catherine and, and Shelly. Um, I've been lucky enough to have been working with Bonnie uh, and sharing this story. And part of my contribution to it is uh, this, this bike ride here that I took. <laughs> Um, right at the tail end of the season on, on the 27th of October, um, I biked, it was about 54 kilometers along this path here that you can see um, up the Humber River and, and sort of along a, a portion of that Caring Place trail. Um, and along the whole way, I, I used a GoPro for the first time, which was really exciting. And I took a video and that's going to be a part of the um, of the mural, it's gonna be embedded in the mural itself. Um, so to me, um, when we're talking about acknowledging the land, uh, to me, I think to acknowledge the land is to listen to it and to respect it and to carry its story in a good way. Um, I think to listen to it is to be by, be on it um, and to be present with it, uh, to respect it by recognizing and sharing my gratitude for it. Um, and also for the people who came before me who have also cared for it and, and respected it. And to carry its story by creating space for its voice and, and its memories and in things like this. Um, and through an ongoing kind of gratitude and, and, and open conversation with it. Um, my biking has, has kind of become my personal way of, of holding a reciprocal sort of relationship with the land. Um, it's my way of kind of actively engaging with uh, the green spaces that we have here in the city. Um, and it's my way of grounding myself as well, um, especially in a place that's constantly going at full speed. It's really nice to get a chance to kind of slow down and, and just be present. So I'm, I'm really grateful to know that way of engaging with the land. I don't think that I've always been able to do that in the same way. Um, and I think it's, it's for me, it's a way of maintaining my own sovereignty on the land and, and a way of maintaining its sovereignty as well. And it was really powerful to, to take this journey and to um, see others kind of enjoying it in a, in a similar way. It was really busy. It was super packed uh, the whole way up. Um, all of the trails, it, it's kind of separate trails now. It's not all one big one. So I got a chance to see a lot of different trails going north up, up the Humber. And um, all of them were just full of people and um, dogs and kids and bikes and rollerblades. And it was, it was great. And it was a beautiful fall day as well. So, um, but it was, it was really important for me to see the trail being used. Um, and to know that the trails and, and the Humber itself is still a, a beloved part of our landscape here. Um, and it reminded me that, that this work and um, what, what we're doing here is, is so much more than, than a GoPro video or <laughs> than, a, than a mural. Um, it's, it's a continuum of, of story, it's storytelling. Um, and it's giving that that voice to the land. So really excited to share that with everybody. I'm not going to be sharing it here today, but but this is the trail that that I took going up. It's wonderful. And is there another slide after this? I think there is. Here I think it is. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I think the thing is, it's just obviously such a natural, it still is such a natural artery mm -hmm. that people move along. And it's, it must have been very moving to see that. And how, how hard is it to find your way up the Humber on a bicycle? Like, is it, is it broken and you find yourself staggering through parking lots, you know, kind of trying to figure out where to go next? Or is it fairly? You know, it's, it's not that hard. Um, I think I naturally gravitate towards water systems. So mm. I'll find myself there, whether I want to be there or not. Um, <laughs> I always just end up along a river. So <laughs> I, yeah. I can't speak for everybody, but it wasn't, it really wasn't that hard. Um, obviously lots of people found it and um, finding a way to travel up it through. The, I think it took, I can't remember what it was now, Bonnie, but I spent the whole day doing it. I'm sure mm. I could have done it quicker, but I wanted to yeah. And I think there's spots where the river goes underground, doesn't it? Yeah. Remember? At various places. Yeah. Yeah. So and it changes a detective. Um, it, you can see how it, how it fits with the, with the kind of changing contours of the land now, but um, mm -hmm. the resiliency of rivers is always going to, it's always going to find a way, right? So it gets mm -hmm. pretty tiny at points and pretty huge at some other points, but it's, yeah, it's always there. I can't wait to see your video. Thank you. It's good. When do you think you'll have that? When is that going to be? Just so people that are watching will have a sense of when all these different elements might be there. Of course, it's more fun to come again and again and again and see it in progress. <laughs> I don't think I don't think we've got a chance to when do. we're going to put it up yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think soon. we need it soon. Soon. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. Wonderful. When we get the TV up there. So Bonnie, I think I think you'd had um, a thought that maybe you know a good thing to talk about would be you know what do we still need to what That's right. still needs to be told and what needs to be understand about this. Once again, we're back near the Seed Barker site here with this picture of a, one of the tributaries of the Humber. Um, what still needs to be told? What conversations still need to happen? Yeah, much so storied place. Yeah, so we thought that it would be, this is posed to our, our three elders, to Dominic, to Catherine, to Shelley. Um, you've seen what we're thinking and, and, and what we've included, but we would, we would be very grateful if you would offer your thoughts about what still needs to be told. Well, what still needs to be told? I mean, there are so many things that can be told. But from what we've begun here, from what you created, Bonnie, I believe what needs to be told is to proliferate, mm -hmm. to share what has begun, to make sure that what we have started, this discussion, this circle that is now back together, simply grows mm. includes us all not just us as first nations mm -hmm. but also everyone that lives and share in this land and this sharing this understanding of the area it makes us better it makes us truly understand what the land acknowledgement that is becoming ubiquitous means we should incarnate that through our love of the land to our respect of everyone that was here before us through what has been done before us and this may guide us in all our future decisions in all our future conceptions of this world whenever our actions are geared toward a single objective towards the common goal, but towards this vision that may animate us. That is when we can create something that is better for all the seven future generations. Mm -hmm. And it comes from this discussion, from coming together. No one can actually plan the right thing for the seven future generations. But then again, everyone can, as long as they work and listen each other in the present 
Mm-hmm. Catherine, what are you finding yourself thinking about? Um, thank you. I think uh, so, so many moving things have been said and so many moving things are felt uh, while observing the pieces of the mural that, uh, that we've been able to see so far. Um, and I think of the carrying place trail as a continuum through time. And I very much relate to Mariah's sentiments about the land and um, land acknowledgements. But I think for me, uh, the vessel that is containing the pipes um, is a beautiful um, healing vessel. It uh, refers to the peacemaker's canoe. Uh, it, it, uh, it speaks of peace. It speaks of holding these precious objects in a beautiful way, in an enlightened way. And I use that because of the references to the, the shiny quality of the peacemaker's canoe. And so for me, I see it as a healing uh, journey, uh, a healing vessel, uh, a path along the continuum of time that will help us to mend our wounds. And when I say wounds, I also refer to the wounds rent in the earth through the process of excavation, which I think is something that um, perhaps we don't address enough in our conversations. Um, the earth is a, you know, is a conscious being, a, a deity, if you will, a presence, uh, um, the mother that sustains us all. And I think about the constant um, withdrawing of these sacred objects as in, in much the same way as I think of uh, the withdrawing of the bones from, from sacred ossuaries. Um, they're part of the earth. We are part of the earth. Um, those, those rents, those, uh, those wounds in the land need to be healed. So this depiction for me is kind of like an activation toward that healing. Um, and I think it's beautiful in that way. And I also think it's very numinous in that way. I think it, it, it activates the psych to move through the process of that healing or into that healing space. And also allows take us healing back to the mural. between the peoples, mm -hmm. between the peoples who are involved in this project in terms of referring to the Anishinaabe and the Wendat. I think it, it will help to heal our, our rents, our wounds. We've, uh, you know, all of the people in Ontario have been through a great deal of turmoil and strife. And for me, this gives an opportunity for us to um, kind of come together in, in the depiction of these pipes, because I think in a way they represent the, the spirit of the land, the spirit of the people, the history of the people uh, along that trail, which to me, as I said, represents time. So we have this beautiful vessel of journeying uh, through time and space, which contains the heart of the land, um, which you know runs along river spaces. There, there, it's just so rich in terms of its uh, sim symbolic quality, but also I really feel that it it is like an activation in itself toward healing. Um, so what, ne what more needs to be happening or what, what part of the conversation hasn't happened or where can we go from here? I think, uh, I think a continuance of honoring these sacred objects and an acknowledgement of um, the healing that needs to happen not only for the people but also for the earth itself in this way and our waters which you know, brings us to this consciousness of uh, climate change and the ways in which we have dealt with the land. We need to return to the honorable harvest um, mm. instead of uh, kind of extracting um, aspects of history that speak to perhaps damages rather than healing. Uh, I know I'm being a bit abstract, but I think you follow my, mm -hmm. my drift, so to speak. <laughs> Healing, restorative ceremony, I think, yeah. is so important. And I think this is that. Thank you.
I mean, when I think, Bonnie, that this moment for our institution could have been, you know, had we negotiated it and not fought it through, could have been a display of effigy pipes in a case mm -hmm. with, a, with a didactic label, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we knew that we wanted to do something to make it demonstrably clear to our visitors that this was not, a, you know, that there was a huge, deep, many thousand year old history here but it's really, you know, thank goodness that we that we connected on this because this is just not only wonderful for the visitors to the museum, but also becoming a kind of diplomatic moment between between all of you, which I find, you know, I find it real a real honor to witness. I also, uh, Catherine, listening to you talk um, about you know resource use, basically the honorable harvest. I love that phrase. Um, but, you know, in the gallery right now, we have an exhibition called Uninvited Canadian Women Artists in the Modern Moment. And in the last gallery there, there is a, a magnificent, truly marvelous display of Coast Salish cedar root baskets. And then beside them, paintings of trees by Emily Carr and paintings that she also made of resource extraction, um, of um, clear cutting, which she thought was one of the great evils of her day. And she was, you know, quite an activist in that regard. And also, as we know, a person who, you know, had a great sense of the dignity and importance of indigenous culture seen from a, you know, a hundred years ago, her frame of reference is probably very limited to the way that we think about our cultures today. And her understanding would have been very limited by her own background. Nonetheless, you know, she was, she linked environmentalism and the rights of indigenous people in her imagination. And, you know, so that insight is, is interest is happening at the bottom of the ramp. And then the, when they make the journey all the way through to the end, they get to the other end of Canada and <laughs> British Columbia and the Coast Salish baskets and Emily Carr's living trees, which are just what you say, Catherine, living, breathing be fellow beings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she obviously really felt that deeply. So mm -hmm. she learned a lot just like we're all learning a lot from you. I, I also just wanted to honor the fact that I note that Bonnie has painted the interior of the vessel uh, the color of red ochre. And I, uh, I very much appreciate that uh, as, a, um, as a depiction of, and uh, um, it's, it's noted and, and appreciated. I think it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, and, and there's a lot of history around ochre's use, uh, which we don't obviously have time to go into now, but I appreciate that, Bonnie. Thank you. Now, if I may come back to the canoe itself mm -hmm. and these depictions of those pipes. The Huron Wendat Nation, we, we felt like just mere reproduction or pictures of those pipes do not render justice to what they are and what they meant and still means to us. That is why we prefer for them to be actually seen with your own eyes or depicted as you will feel them as they may be seen from the spirit world, which was basically the, the beginning of the reflection that we've had regarding how can we depict them? We don't want them to be forgotten but we still don't want them to be cheapened down by being simply displayed. Mm -hmm. And so having them represented as proper spirits in a stone canoe was no coincidence. Mm -hmm. Stone canoes mean a lot. Tekanawita, Rwanda helped the Odnoshone become what they are. But the stone canoes are also used by the little people, according to the Wendat legends. And those vessels of transportation were always used by special beings, special beings that would change everything around them. Mm. And this reference to Tekanawita, the great peacemaker, as the Odnoshone call him, it matters a lot, it means so much as we are in the process of reconciliation in Canada, in Ontario, in every single town. But we 
should also reconcile ourselves with our past as indigenous, as settlers, as more recent immigrants as well. We all should come to terms with what people did before us and then look forward and maybe follow these pipes in their path, these pipes in their path towards something better, something where there's a moment in time where a relationship is better, where we are healthier in the way we deal with who we are, with where we're going, and we truthfully work towards this better tomorrow. And that is, I believe, one of the better representation that we can give and the best possible vessel for those beings. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, I have you I have you muted, I think. Well, I'm listening, you see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. We'd reserve some time at the end for questions, but I'll tell you that the Q&A and the chat don't have any questions in them. They just are full of expressions of, of gratitude and appreciation for this conversation we've had tonight. So is there a time for me? I, I realize we're running over. Is there time for a comment from me or did you just of want course. me to? Close no, of course. Please. Of course. At the beginning of uh, Bonnie's um, talk, she was talking about the um, the effigy pipes themselves, and one of the one of the things that I remember uh, very recently, doing some work at uh, uh, Gabe Mikinang, which is where the trail ends. I was working with a um, elder there and we wanted to, well, we didn't, but some people wanted to move these really huge stones. And he had said, his name is um, Neil. And he said um, to us, well, why would you move the grandfathers? How do you think they would feel if you move those stones from where they've been for thousands of years over here, just so that you think they might look pretty? So, so we thought about that and uh, it just got me thinking as we were talking today and Dominic was sharing about the repatriation of, it's the repatriation of the grandfather stone. And for us in this region, it really feels like, to me, it really feels like it's this moment where they've come home. So how do you feel when you come home you feel happy, you know, to come back to the place where you emerged from. And that was the, the, the feeling that after the emotion that I went through was this joy that how the grandfather, um, Asin, has a name, how they felt coming back to this land that they came from. So when I thought about that, I also um, was moved by Mariah's uh, Mariah's connection with the water. So the mouth of the trail is the Gabe Mikinong, sometimes called Gabe Ganong. And we, we sometimes forget that, that that's the end of the trail, where the carrying place is only talking about a very short part of the trail. And, and we have some of those maps, by the way, interestingly enough, from uh, a French explorer as well. But when we think of where the trail starts, when we think about where are we going next, where the trail starts, the trail starts there in um, Zhongyang, Zhongyang, Minasing, and the trail starts in um, Manadogame, and it has, it starts in Chiminasing and it's Mjikining um, and Kuchiching, and all of those names are their relationship to the water. So when I'm thinking from water to water, then it would be really good if we could also recognize the communities 
that are that are here and that have been living on this along these rivers and and um which some people used to call the mighty humber but along these uh, waterway systems for thousands of years coming back and forth and those relationships even today um that's what we called our communities it's, so it's to me when i'm thinking about it i'm thinking like there's no accident that the language, our language is Nishnabe Mowin, is written on the land. So when we think about that, and we think about the names, even Toronto, Minasing, and Ajonyang Minasing, Lake Simcoe, and all, and when we think about it that way, it's this journey of the water, but it's also talking about the people, where those people traveled from, back and forth, and with such fluidity, much faster the whole day. Well, hmm. it was even much faster than that, that we traveled along the waters and how, how if we could capture the names of the communities and the names of significant stopping places of Anishinaabe people. So not to um, take away from anything, but to sort of expand it a little bit more uh, and acknowledge that that connection in the language and water to water, mm -hmm. what those relationships are like. And then also the clans, Bonnie, you had talked about the clan, the um, wolf sculpture, uh, really significant are clans as well. So significant in this way, um, the people that were originally here. So we have um, otter clan, wolf clan, turtle clan, um, all these different fish clan and fish clan. <laughs> um, and we have rivers of Lake Simcoe named after my particular clan, which is the Muskelunge, Muskinoja fish. And, and if we can try in some way to bring that education and that knowledge forward, because I think that when Dominic talks about the wider community, there's this, this, this knowledge that we can help bring about. And in the doing of that, perhaps also uh, get people thinking about what Mariah was talking about is like her, her commitment to um, how she lives and works on the land. Mm -hmm. So I wanted just to share that, um, share that with you, miigwech. Thanks, Miigwech, Shelley. Bonnie, do you have any final thoughts before we turn back to Shelley to close? Just this a really final thought, um, just to, to say, yes, uh, we are um, in the process actually today and yesterday uh, talking about Ajikaning. Um, and the uh, the weirs and the importance of that of that um, that mouth of the Lake Simcoe and what Lake Simcoe means and so yes um, we we are we are interested in this as um, I think Dominic said it and I think that Sarah you said it also in some ways this is a diplomatic mm -hmm. mission uh, we are we are attempting to open conversations that have been longing to be opened for a long, long time. And, uh, and we're, I'm so grateful for everything that you have offered, Shelley and Catherine and Dominic. And of course, we will be talking with you by email as well, still trying to, um, trying to make sure that, that this opportunity that the McMichael has given us um, won't miss anything that we will that we will use this opportunity uh, for reconciliation among ourselves and and with people across Ontario to try to move that conversation forward as best we can and yeah to bring healing because we're it's been it's been hard on all of us I think uh, to learn some of the sad stories the dreadful dreadful stories um, we need to heal, and uh, if, that, if that can help in that way, then really good. Thank you. Yeah, really good. <laughs> that's you, that's all I have to say. So, Shelley, do you want to do uh, 
make our make your final um, closing gesture for us. I think we still, Jen, do not have questions in the. We don't. Um, I was just going to say before we close formally um, with Shelley's uh, help, I just wanted to say on behalf of the McMichael, thank you to Bonnie, Mariah, Dominic, Catherine, Shelley, and Sarah um, for this really special conversation. Um, I hope everyone in the audience enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed uh, convening it and having it tonight. Um, I know that words said tonight are going to be echoing in my mind for a very long time. Um, and I wanted to just encourage uh, those in the audience to visit us at McMichael. We're open six days a week. Um, tickets are available on our website. And for the next uh, few weeks, uh, on weekdays, you'll see uh, Bonnie and Mariah creating uh, and finishing their mural. Um, so thank you again uh, for joining us virtually tonight. We look forward to seeing you in person soon. And I'll turn it back over to Shelley Charles to um, close our circle. Uh, Shelly, I think you're Shelley, muted. You're on mute. There I just is. wanted to mention uh, in uh, relation to what Bonnie was talking about in chickening, it becomes really important to be talking to people uh, from the local communities and people mm -hmm. that are referred, uh, people that have that knowledge. For example, um, at any rate, I will um, finish with the closing, I we're way over and I don't want to take any more time. So we'll the say yeah, up, to go, go up to go get chimmy gwetch, uh go kenege go gami jen. Kinu kinue ma, ge kinue ma na ke gajin dayan, we do koshin. Uh kinue ma shin na ke gajin dayan. Ah join the mission, join the mission on up to go get chimmy gwetch. Thank you so much. And good night, everyone, and thank you for being with us. Thank you.